Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Zaman and welcome to the sixth talk of the series of critical care nursing webinars from Apna Merit. Uh, I am Dr. Zaman and today your presenters are going to be Dr. Marine Malik and Zahira Amir Ali, uh, both from AKU. Before we ask them to give their talks, just some uh, housekeeping. There are handouts available and the link is here. There's also a YouTube video link which should be posted so you can visit this again if needs be. There are feedback forms that you need to fill, especially if you want us to give you the certificates at the end of the whole series. And again, I will start off with some MCQs and we will do an extra ninth session which is going to focus on all the talks that we have gone through and do some MCQs there. So the questions from the last sessions, what I've done is I've done a thematic analysis rather than go through all of them. And what was most frequently asked was the doses of the inotropes, followed up by uh, why the tubing needs to be changed for propofol and whether milrinone is an inotrope. So just to clarify, anything which can make the heart beat strongly and quickly is an inotrope. Anything which squeezes the blood vessels is a vasopressor. And so most of the medications which do one can do some degree of the other as well. But there are medications like adrenaline, which is basically an inotrope and a vasopressor. Okay. So yes, milrinone on the other hand is an inotrope because it affects primarily the heart, make it beat more strongly. The problem with that is that it can drop the blood pressure because of its effects on the blood vessels. Okay. So propofol. Propofol is a drug which is put in something called intralipid, which is fat, really. It's a combination of soya bean oil, eggs, phospholipids, and glycerin. And ever since it was conceived, there have been studies about infections associated with it. So the two big ones were the one in 1995 when they identified increased risk of sepsis, and one in 2010, which again did the same thing. Both studies identified that the risk of infection was quite high. Based on this, they actually had a look. And what they realized was this. So you see this little blue line there? The blue line is telling you how bugs are growing. And the red line again shows bug growing, but the blue one shows them growing in propofol. And the red line is showing them growing in other anesthetic agents. So if you look at the blue one, it says that by the end of 48 hours, you have grown 472 colony forming units per ml as opposed to a normal anesthetic agent, which is only growing four. So there's a hundred fold increase in growing bugs in a propofol infusion, primarily because of that fat, which works as food for bugs. Uh, and this we know clinically increases the risk of sepsis as you have seen in these two studies. And result of that is that the people who make this said to change the tubing after 24 hours. And as you can see, there's a big jump from six to 20, uh, 24 hours when it comes to the number of bacteria that could be found in propofol, okay? So that's the rationale of changing the tubing. Next comes the doses of inotropes. So this is in the handouts. You can go to the website and see them. Uh, I know you can't read any of this stuff because of how small it is, but this is what it looks like when you see it up close. It tells you the name of the medication. It tells you what strength it makes, tells you what concentration it will end up with and whoever is prescribing needs to prescribe it at what rate and how to give it, okay? There are also handouts which tell you what are the side effects, which they tell you what are the effects of the drugs and of course it goes on. And it's not just for vasopressors, it's a list of 30 odd common infusions given in critical care, okay? So I hope that answers the questions. And I will now move on to Mrs. N. So as you remember, this was a lady who came in with DKA. We identified that she became hypoxic very quickly. We found she was COVID positive. We initially gave her some steroids, but she developed ARDS and delirium. So we thought the best thing to do would be to intubate her, sedate her, ventilate her, and prone her. After that, she developed some hemodynamic deterioration. And the last session was very much on vasopressors and how they might be used to help her. And now today's session is looking at her when she is 12th day into admission. The doctors have been looking after her and they feel that she has improved enough that she has come off those vasopressors she was started on last time and that her our ventilatory support is minimal. So the question is that they have been looking at it on a day by day basis as to when she's good to wean and they think she might be. 
So this is where I'll hand over to Dr. Mehreen, who will go ahead and give you a talk on how to assess for weaning. And then uh, Zahra will talk about how to assess for extubation and how to do it. Okay, so over to you, Dr. Mehreen. Next slide. Okay, so our learning objectives today would be that each participant should be able to define what weaning and extubation is, understand the process of liberation from ventilator, identify barriers of weaning and extubation, understand weaning protocols, identify the supplies required, and the role of nurses in um, weaning and extubation. So liberation from ventilator is divided into two parts, weaning uh, I'm going to explain, and extubation will be uh, done by Zahira. Weaning um, basically involves two major portions. One, we have to assess the readiness of the patient to uh, be liberated and then gradually decreasing the sub ventilatory support, leading to a spontaneous deep breathing patient, uh, which is ready for extubation. Thanks. So they say that intubation uh, is an art and extubation is science. The patient is on mechanical ventilator. The moment the patient was intubated, we will plan its extubation. Why do we need to wean and extubate the patient? Because uh, the more the patient is going to be on the mechanical ventilator, the more his risk of contracting ventilator-associated pneumonia, ventilator-associated lung injury, and pulmonary barotrauma. The decreased ventilator days are going to decrease his ICU stay, that may uh, decrease the financial burden on the family due to ventilator and ICU costs, decrease the risk of infection. Since the patient is on the bed and immobilized, uh, he is at risk of uh, developing venous thromboembolism, she in our case, and uh, that may lead to overall increased morbidity and mortality. Next slide, please. Which patients to wean? What are the indications? Every patient who has been on mechanical ventilator for more than 24 hours is eligible to get weaned off. Unless there is uh, some contraindication, the patient is either an organ donor, is brain dead, or there are some causes which are irreversible. Considering, um, next. Okay, so which patients do we not mean? There's some contraindications and a simple mnemonic is used, which is means not. Any patient who has an active disease, is a known COPD or asthmatic and is not optimized, has heart disease, is in fluid overload, cardiac failure, has electrolyte derangements like hyper or hypophosphatemia, hyper or hyperkalemia, or hyper or hypermagnesemia, has severe anxiety and delirium as as for more than six, has a neuromuscular disease, uh, which is impairing the patient to get off the ventilator, prolonged um, ventilation, or is in shock or in sepsis, is nutrition deficient, uh, very hypoglycemic or hypoglycemic, is uh, on long-term opiates and other sedative, has acute alcohol withdrawal, or is in mesodermic coma, active thyroid disease. Next. So, when to wean? So there is no golden R to wean, um, but we will see the patient clinically and decide as per patient, the patient that what is the exact good time uh, to wean that patient off when the primary cause has been reversed or is optimized. Uh, if the trial fails, then we'll again do that the next day after 24 or 12 hours. Next. So the question is going to come up. Which of the following might be a reason to delay meaning? FiO2 of less than 45%. B is resolution of a reason for intubation. C, asthmatic who remains wheezy. D, patient who is not anxious or delirious. If you see a pop-up on your screen, please answer one of it. Okay, so 30 seconds, and as, so just to focus, the question is which of the following might be a reason to delay the weaning process? And the answers have come that 45, 53% people have said when FiO2 is less than 
Okay. Uh, other than that, 33% actually went asthmatic who remains wheezy. And then one person each has said resolution or of reason for intubation and patient is not anxious or delirious. So of course, the right answer would be that anybody who's had resolution of reason for intubation should be weaned. So this is not a reason to delay. Patient who is not anxious or delirious, again, no reason to delay. And FIU2 of less than 45% should not, is actually saying that there's no reason to delay. So the only time in this MCQ, which says that there's a reason to delay weaning is an asthmatic who remains wheezy. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So who can be? Uh, it's a team-based approach, basically. So it's a collaboration between nurses, respiratory therapists, and physicians. Uh, a lot of trials have taken place uh, in which a nurse-driven protocol uh, of taking off the ventilator versus physician shows that it's equally uh, same. And uh, different institutions have different institutional practices. They follow those. And uh, but overall, taking off the ventilator, every a uh, single person who's involved in ICU is involved uh, to get the patient off, including the nurses. Nurses play a very important role. Next. How to read. So overall, first we have to assess that the, the patient is ready to uh, get weaned off. For that, we have a subjective, a clinical criteria. We go system-wise, we see uh, the central um, nervous system, how the patient is, the respiratory parameters. We see the cardiovascular parameters. Then we decide whether we have to wake them up or not. By waking up, we have to decrease sedation. For that, we use a sedation awakening trial uh, that takes place from two to four hours. Whatever sedative or analgesic there is running, we have to decrease it gradually. Uh, if it's propofol running on 100, we decrease it to 50, like decrease it 50%. If it's midazolam, uh, we stop it altogether. If it's 6 uh, we decrease it hourly by 0.2 uh, mics per kg per uh, hour. So it depends on what is running. If it's an OPH, then we uh, stop the continuous infusion and uh, we give them uh, intermittent boluses if the patient uh, is complains of pain. And uh, we have to keep on talking to the patient. Once the patient is awake of sedation, we have to tell them that we are going to uh, wake you up now. And uh, the way that we are going to do that is either by decreasing the ventility support gradually uh, or uh, taking the support completely off. On taking it off, it can be either uh, being on the ventilator or removing the patient completely from the ventilator through a deep net. The common methods are uh, in which we take the patient off the ventilator are through a TP trial. And uh, then there are specific modes for weaning, which are the SIMV and pressure support. Um, usually pressure support mode is uh, the one used. And uh, the method that we usually use, which is again popularity, is five by five, five pressure support and five feet. And then uh, we see how the patient behaves, get a serial ABG done and see if the patient is weanable or not. Next. So on every round from dawn, uh, the patient has to have a station uh, stoppage. Patient has to have a um, a uh, spontaneous breathing trial. So we plan it every day. So we have a web bundle and we have to fill it up and we have to do that. So the first step um, in readiness to make the patient off the ventilator is making the patient medically stable and uh, being able to breathe on his own. Next. So clinical assessment, we have to see respiratory parameters. We have to see cardiovascular parameters. We have to see the psychological and neurological status of the patient. We we'll do that one by one. Next. The respiratory, we have to see how the oxygenation is of the patient and how is the work of breathing. Next. In oxygenation, the FiO2 has to be less than 40%. PEEP uh, should be done five to eight, not more than eight. EF ratio should be less than 150. And in work of breathing, the patient should not be disconnect. Uh, the respiratory rate should be less than 35. And then uh, we see the uh, Tobin's index or the rapid shallow breathing index, uh, which I'll explain uh, ahead in the slides. Next. Um, respiratory criteria, we have to see if the patient is in respiratory distress, if the saturation is um, 90, less than 90 or not, the respiratory rate should 
be not be less than 10 or more than 35. And uh, if there's a functioning tracheostomy present, we can either one or not. Patient can cough and mobilize its secretions. And the ventilatory parameters should be that the condition that causes respiratory failure is now resolved and the patient no longer requires mechanical ventilation. The bladder pressure should not be more than 30 and feet should not be greater than uh, five and FiO2 should be um, 40, not less than 40%, not more than 40%. In ABGs, the pH should not be um, uh, less than 7.25, PO2 should be uh, more than 92, and PF ratio should be more than 150 meters of strain. So cardiovascular-wise, the patient should not be uh, tachycardic, like his baseline heart rate uh, should be not more than 20% rising during the trial phase, and uh, the patient should be on not more than two pressors. Um, his blood pressures uh, should not be 20% or more than his actual uh, rate while, while we're giving the trial. The cardiac, um, so that's the same. The patient should not have any chest pain or any signs of myocardial ischemia or new, new ACG changes. Neurologically, there should not be any seizures, any neurological deficits that were not present before. The patient um, should not uh, have uh, any active uh, complaints of pain. And it should be able to follow your instructions, should be able to verbally open eyes on your command, should be awake and alert of time, place, and person. Next. Psychologically, um, the patient, usually patients are in ICU psychosis if they have been on prolonged ventilation. Uh, so you have to ally the patient's fear, decrease his anxiety, and you have to assess whether the patient needs an in dialysis before extubation or not. That's for us to decide on clinical parameters. But the patient should be uh, very calm, and you should encourage the patient to uh, go ahead with the spontaneous breathing trial. Next. So there are some other factors which we have to consider, uh, like keeping the patient on the mechanical ventilator. Is there any surgical pro uh, procedure is planned uh, the day after or sometime near that we will not wean the patient off the ventilator? Uh, is there any active complaints uh, like surgical complications like bleeding or hematomas? The drains are doing well, and uh, we have to uh, then uh, taper off the sedation successfully. The hemoglobin should not be um, less than seven, and the patient should not be hyperthermic or hypothermic. That's going to increase the work of breathing, and then the patient is not going to be uh, excavated easily. And the pain should be managed with pain medications. Yes. Okay, so there's a question coming up. A patient who is admitted to ICU after emergency surgery for gangrene of right leg is on day three of admission. He has a RAS score of zero. That is, he is tolerant, awake, and responsive. Vitals are stable, and he's not on any organ support. You are thinking of wheeling when the surgeon tells you that they want to take the patient back to the theater for a wheeler. What do you do? Wean and excavate for now, or reassess for wheeling after you return from theaters? I'm expecting everybody's going to answer that well. And and you seem to be right. Yes, 100%. <laughs> wow. Answers at the, the moment. The people are listening very keenly. <laughs> well, there's uh, one person has said that they would wean and extubate now. Mm. But 94% of the people. Now they know. Yes, 94% of the people no, have given no. the right answer, which is reassessed for weaning after return from theater. No. Cool. So how do we wean? Are there any protocols? Is it physician driven? Or, you know, some patients get self extubated. What do we do? How do we do about it? Next. The it's said that protocol-driven team approach has been shown to be more successful than an individual um, physician-driven team approach. So there are uh, several protocols um, of meaning. They are different for different institutions, but all of them um, are given in this, this, this very simplified form, uh, which shows that there should be a daily assessment of spontaneous breathing. Uh, the patient should be clinically stable. Um, mentation should be good. There should be adequate oxygenation. The SAO2 should be more than 90%. FiO2 should be um, maintaining on 40%, um, not less than that, not more than that. 
and a PF ratio should be more than 200, P should not be uh, more than five, and pulmonary function, the respiratory rate should not be more than 35, and tidal volume should be around uh, more than uh, five liters per minute, and mid ventilation should be less than uh, 10 to 50. And there should be no significant respiratory aspirators. If the patient meets all, then we begin uh, to uh, use CPAP of five uh, for three minutes for rapid breathing index. If the rapid breathing index is less than uh, 105, then we go ahead with the spontaneous breathing trial for 30 to 120 minutes. Uh, the TTP trial can be used from 10 liters um, per minute uh, at FIO2 of 40%. But since COVID, uh, we usually avoid uh, the TPs. Uh, if the patient is um, successful through the spontaneous breathing trial, we make the patient NPO for uh, further um, extubation. We do a cough leak test and then we extubate. But if the patient fails to um, uh, pass on to the successful breathing trial, we put them on their previous uh, support again. And uh, even if the patient is unable to uh, pass the awakening test, then we start 50% of the last um, um, analgesia and uh, sedation uh, that we were using before. And uh, then we made the patient to the level where the patient was comfortable. Next. So rapid shallow breathing index or the turbine um, index is just uh, the frequency of the respiratory rate divided by the tidal volume. Uh, it's a very good predictor and um, less than 105 uh, patients might be successful to wean. It's 97% sensitive. And more than 105 likely to fail on the situation trial. Next. So how do we do the spontaneous breathing trial? So either we take the patient completely off uh, uh, the ventilator and put him on the T piece. I'll show you the T piece in the next slide. And, uh, or uh, it can be ventilator driven. Uh, either we take off all the um, PEEP and support and make it zero on zero, or we keep some of the pressure support uh, with low or no PEEP. And then there's automatic tube compensation. Some of the um, ventilators that we're invented, they have, uh, they can uh, undergo this automatic tube compensation, but the pressure support is better than automatic tube compensation because of the tube resistance that has to overcome. There's a limitation to it that the intracranial tube should be uh, seven or less. Then only we can uh, have this um, trial for that. And then we have CPAP as well. We can do that. Next. So this is the T-piece. Um, we just place the 15 millimeter adapter end of the endotracheal tube just outside. It gets connected on it uh, snugly. And then uh, from one side of the flexible tube, you can add the oxygen. Uh, oxygen is going to go in as shown in the picture. And then from the other end, carbon side goes out. But then again, uh, in COVID times, this causes a lot of um, uh, airway uh, uh, threat to the uh, to the nurses who are doing it, unless you're in a negative pressure room and you have a uh, complete PPE present. So, but this this is one of the things that we can, you know, some patients are very good, have good toleration of TPs, and then they're excavated easily. So what time do we, how much time do we let the patient breathe spontaneously? So 30 minutes are usually sufficient. Some, Sometimes uh, in certain situations, we can go up to 120, but not more than that. 30 minutes is pretty fine. Next. So if the patient fails a spontaneous breathing trial, what do we do? Like the patient is intolerant. How do we know that? Because his respiratory rate goes up to 35 or more. His arterial pH on the ABG is less than 7.32. His oxygen saturations are dropping. His entire carbon dioxide has increased by more than 10% uh, his retaining carbon dioxide. His heart rate is more than 140, that is 20% above his baseline. His respiratory muscles um, are, accessory muscles are being used. He's diaphoretic. Um, his systolic blood pressure has increased to 180 systolic and diastolic more than 90. And or either he's hypertensive and he's very anxious. He's complaining of pain, severe pain, or chest pain, or there is any new um, uh, changes in the ECG, then that means that the patient has failed the spontaneous breathing. Next. So there's a question coming up. Which of the following is not a criteria for failed spontaneous breathing trial? Respiratory rate more than 35 breaths per minute, pH less than 7.32. 
systolic blood pressure more than 150, heart rate more than 140, anxiety. Let's see how the participants do in this one. Let me go to the last slide so they can see what the criteria are. Yeah. It's an open book test. So I, I, I think the fact that this was a negative question is another reason why people have chosen yeah. the answers they have. The question was not the criteria for failed, but which is not a criteria. So, confused. so I think people got confused. So, yeah. but I, at least that was the idea for them to actually have a look at it much, much more closely. And so you can see an equal distribution between 25% thinking it's breaths more than 35, which is a criteria for failed, pH less than 7.32, which is a criteria for failed, and anxiety, 38% saying that. So I suspect most people approached with criteria they thought were the more important for failure. It's the blood pressure, which is the right answer because it's a systolic less more than 180, which is a criteria for failure of uh, breathing trial rather than 150. Okay, thank you. And that's where we are. So. Yeah. So. The weaning was successful. How do we know that? Because now the patient has a respiratory rate of less than 25. The heart rate and blood pressure are within 15% of the personal baseline. The tidal volume is adequate to 2 to 5 mils per kg. His pH is more than 7.33. His PO2 is more than 60. His carbon dioxide is less than 45. His saturation is more than 90%. There are no arrhythmias and there's no use of accessory muscles. There are a few complications that we might suffer during weaning process. So uh, the patient can, during the process of weaning, during the process of spontaneous uh, ventilation, develop hypoxemia, increase work of breathing, physical and psychological stress, anxiety, and that may lead to increased oxygen consumption. Hypoxia may occur if the patient isn't ready to breathe independently and can tolerate the decreasing ventilatory settings. Next. Cardiac dysfunction affects weaning too. Transition from positive pressure ventilation to a spontaneous breathing may precipitate a worse and pre-existing heart failure. Significant negative fluid balance uh, should be achieved before extubation. And uh, if the patient fails to do that, um, then weaning can be demonstrated by using a serum and a terminal pro-BNP uh, levels during a spontaneous breathing trial. Next. So, so the patient has um, been successfully uh, off uh, the sedation, has passed the uh, spontaneously awakening trial and the spontaneously breathing trial. The patient is NPO for uh, some time now and is ready for extubation. Uh, over to Zahid. Thank you so much, Dr. Marine. Uh, for explaining us weaning so well and I hope that the participants are able to understand it now clearly because weaning is very important uh, before an extubation. Uh, without weaning, you cannot extubate the patient. So let me discuss the process of extubation. Next slide, please. So what is extubation? Extubation is basically the removal of the endotracheal tube uh, for the patients who are on mechanical ventilators. And why is it so important to extubate the patient is that it reduces the risk of ventilator associated events. And those uh, VAEs could be ventilator associated pneumonia, sepsis, acute respiratory distress syndrome, pulmonary embolism, barotrauma and pulmonary edema. So all of these factors basically um, you know, through extubation, you can deal with them. So there is an extubation criteria, criteria similar to uh, weaning criteria, uh, which I've divided into respiratory, cardiac, and other factors. So the respiratory uh, criteria is if the patient is able to pass the spontaneous breathing trial, then you can, you know, extubate. The tidal volume on the ventilator should be greater than 6 ml per kg with the respiratory rate of between 12 to 25 breaths per minute, which is quite a safe rate. 
Uh, moreover, this uh, oxygen saturation should be 95 and above. We also consider 92 and above, but it is safe to have 95 and above. Most importantly, the patient should be able to, you know, uh, cough appropriately and clear out all the secretions because once you take out the tube, the the, uh, the independent spontaneous coughing of the patient can, you know, clear all the secretions and uh, prevent from any sort of infection later on. So coughing exercise or uh, coughing reflex is very important. And along with that, we also usually see the gag reflex to prevent any sort of aspiration. And uh, if you are looking that the patient is having a uh, very frequent suctioning and you, you require a very frequent suctioning, like every two hourly suctioning, then you need to reconsider whether you need to extubate the patient or, uh, you know, give some time uh, before a proper extubation. And uh, along with that, conscious uh, a patient should be conscious enough to protect his or her own airway, which means the GCS, again, is very important. Uh, you cannot extubate a patient on five GCS or six GCS. At least it should be um, 12 and above, 11, 12 and above. Next slide, please. So the cardiovascular criteria is that heart rate and blood pressure should be plus minus of the 20 percentage of baseline, whatever the baseline the patient is having, for example, 120 by 80. So uh, one, uh, 140, which is 20 above and um, uh, 60, which is uh, 80 below should be the safe uh, blood pressure range. And that goes similar for the heart rate. There should be no vasopressors or inotropes, or if the inotropes are administered, they should be in very low dose, like 0.02 mics per kg per minute, uh, nor epinephrine is, is all right, instead of you know um, two mics per kg per minute of nor epinephrine, which is not acceptable for extubation criteria. So which means that the patient should be hemodynamically stable. And uh, moreover, patient temperature should be maintained. Uh, patient should not be hypothermic or hyperthermic, again, because it um, you know, affects the metabolic rate of the body and which may hamper the extubation. The pain should be controlled enough that the patient after extubation could cough easily because if uh, pain is not controlled, um, for example, if, any, if there's any sort of abdominal surgery and patient is having a lot of pain and you're not able to control the pain, the patient would not cough. And uh, that would, you know, again, lead to um, a respiratory distress. So uh, analgesics should be given, but not too much that it sedates the patient or, you know, uh, the patient gets very um, drowsy. So con a conscious level along with a proper pain management is important. And again, uh, you need to see any surgical complications like hematoma and bleeding. Next slide. So question four here is, that doctors are helpful, uh, hopeful, misses, and might be appropriate for weaning, which of the following might not be a concern that needs addressing as part of the uh, plan. So patient was, patient was delirious prior to sedation and intubation. Second option is patient is needing frequent suctioning. Third option, patient's respiratory uh, rate jumps to 32 when sedated, sedation is in, uh, reduced. And last is FiO2 of 30%. You have enough time. You can Wonderful. do this MCQ. Okay. So again, just be wary that this is a negative question. And the reason to ask negative questions is it focuses your attention quite a bit to give the right answer rather than shortcutting to a previous one. Okay. So... Half the people have said previous delirium prior to sedation and intubation. Actually, if somebody has been put sedated while they were delirious, the concern is that when they wake up, they would still be delirious. So it is a concern when you're thinking about extubation that delirium needs to be addressed when you're thinking of taking that tube out. Now, 13% said patient is needing frequent suctioning. Again, that is something you need to consider a plan for if you're thinking about extubation. The fact that patient's respiratory rate jumps to 32 when sedation is reduced should make you worry that there's something going on. Either there's ongoing pain or anxiety, and both of them might be contributing to tachypnea whenever you reduce sedation. And that needs to be, again, considered as part of your plan as to what you're going to do before you take the tube out. So the correct answer was somebody whose oxygen need is only 30%. 33% people got that right. Thank you. Next. Okay. So one of the major um, 
one of the major complications from extubation could be respiratory failure and airway obstruction due to laryngospasm or marked tracheal edema. And we'll be discussing more about how uh, tracheal edema could be assessed. Next slide. Uh, difficult extubation is again a challenge if there's a difficult airway, traumatic airway or difficult intubation was done. Um, then, you know, definitely that leads to a difficult extubation as well. So we check the cuff leak. Cuff leak test is a very, um, you know, basic and essential test that is usually done by physicians, but nurses can also assist. And it is to rule out the laryngeal edema. Next slide. So cuff leak test is basically, um, uh, it shows that if there is an absence of the cuff leak, which means there could be some sort of upper, uh, um, uh, upper respiratory tract or upper airway obstruction that you need to rule out. Um, next slide. So this is the actually the algorithm. Uh, for example, if there is a patient who is planned for an extubation, you need to first check the risk factors for the laryngeal edema. For example, is there any traumatic intubation done in the past or intubation for more than six days because it again causes a lot of edema near the tube side? Uh, was any sort of large endotracheal tube used? Was the patient reintubated multiple times? For example, if the patient has had any spontaneous um, extubation or self extubation, so that is again that could lead to reintubations and um, further leading to laryngeal edema. So if all of these risk factors are not present, you can you know just uh, you don't need to check any sort of uh, cuff leak, and you can directly extubate the patient. But if these risk factors are present, you have to go for a cuff leak test. Um, if there is a leak present, cuff leak is done basically when you apply um, the 10 cc syringe on the pilot balloon of the OETT tube, which is, uh, which is uh, handling the cuff, and you just deflate that cuff, you, you see that whether there is a leak or there is no leak. So if there is a leak, um, you can extubate the patient. But if the leak is absent, uh, you have to again repeat the cuff leak after some time. Um, if there is a leak, again extubate. If there is no leak or a leak is absent, you need to give some management. So the management could be medical management like steroid. Uh, usually 60 mg IV methyl prednisolone is suggested by our doctors to you know, administer for a tracheal uh, edema. And then you can extubate after four to six hours uh, after the steroid has been received by the patient, but making sure that the cuff leak test should be present. And the other therapies that are done um, uh, are uh, preparing for uh, intubation and monitor closely. Uh, intubate if a severe respiratory distress occurs. Uh, you can give a 60 to 125 mg of IV methyl prednisolone. Um, usually, uh, nebulization with epinephrine is also done, not really uh, at our ICU at, here at AKU, but uh, it is an evidence-based practice. And, you know, with the um, oxygen therapy, you can also give the Heliox uh, temporizing measure, which is, again, a gas for stritors, to resolve the stritors. Next. So it is very important that if you see that there is an extubation failure, you have extubated the patient and patient is not able to tolerate that extubation, you immediately have to go for a reintubation. You don't have to delay because delay may you know, worsen the case. So uh, early assessment, early management is very important. Next slide. What could be the complications from uh, early extubation if you are not uh, able to assess the extubation criteria and you just go for an early extubation? So what could be the complications? Uh, premature withdrawal is very dangerous, again, because it leads to hypoxemia, aspiration. It increases the work of breathing. And uh, it also causes a lot of infection, especially the ventilator-associated pneumonia, because um, you know a reintubation and extubation, again, reintubation, so something going in and out of body is leading to uh, the status of infection. And this can, could also lead to an increase in the rate of mortality. Next slide. Okay. So now we'll be discussing the process through which you nurses have to, you know, remember uh, while uh, weaning and extubating the patient. So um, I'll, I'll discuss the steps, but before those steps, I uh, would like to share some of the equipment or supplies that needs to be prepared while you're weaning the patient or while you're planning for extubation. 
The mandatory equipment are any sort of oxygen source, um, for example, humidifier and flow meter, a stethoscope to auscultate the chest, gloves and uh, other PPEs like um, mask and uh, eye goggles, apron or gown. Suction equipment, very important to be kept at bedside, which should be working. Um, cardiac monitor to check the uh, vital signs. Uh, ABG, for ABG analysis, there should be an ABG machine. Uh, 10 ml syringe and disinfectant pad, a pad for um, sterilization. The backup equipment, uh, just in case if the patient fails an extubation and you need to reintubate the patient, so there must be a backup equipment. Uh, there should be OETT uh, of appropriate size, for example, from 6.5 to 8.5, we have it in our ICU. So all those, uh, you know, uh, OETTs must be present in your reintubation equipment. Uh, bag and mask with PEEP valve, airway bougies, tube exchangers, uh, supraglottic devices, uh, any sort of laryngoscope, uh, either manual laryngoscope or the video assisted laryngoscope. Uh, flexible bronchoscope if needed, and uh, emergency drugs, for example, the sedat sedatives and relaxants should be prepared on the bedside along with some emergency life-saving drugs like epinephrine. So the steps for weaning are uh, quite simple, starting with the very basic steps that we follow in all the procedures like verifying the patient's order, preparing all the equipment, assessing patient's clinical condition and readiness to wean, um, uh, check the patient's level of uh, sedation, collaborate uh, to determine when you can initiate the weaning. Perform the hand hygiene, very important, especially in the times of COVID. Um, then confirm the patient's identity using at least two patient identifiers, which means here we use name and MR number. Uh, different practices may go on in different hospitals, but the patient's identity should be confirmed. Uh, then provide privacy to the patient and um, uh, stop the sedation and start the spontaneous awakening trial. Next. Then uh, very important is to introduce yourself to the patient and identify your role. If you're looking that the patient is now starting to awake, uh, you must introduce yourself because otherwise patient usually go into, you know, ICU psychosis and delirium if they're unaware of where they are, what is their environment. So your introduction with the patient, with the family, most important, and explain the procedure to the patient and family according to their learning needs to increase their understanding and allay their fears and enhance their cooperation. Assure that the patient that you will be uh, providing um, the weaning process must, must be coached at every you know, step. You must interact with the patient at every step. Uh, position patient with head of bed elevated to 30 to 45 degrees to reduce the risk of aspiration and ventilatory associated pneumonia. If the patient can't bend uh, at the waist level, use the reverse Trendlenburg position, which means you just, you know, um, um, increase the, uh, the foot level of the patient so that uh, the patient uh, is comfortable while, while um, having the weaning process. And also raise the bed to waist level to prevent the caregivers being uh, back strain because we as caregivers, if we are not able to, you know, um, maintain our uh, body dynamics properly, again, we'll face a lot of back strains in future. So uh, bed should be raised at the appropriate level. Uh, make sure that the patient is attached to the cardiac monitor. Uh, and with the ventilator and an alarm limits of both the cardiac monitor and the ventilator should be set appropriately and or should be audible to the staff. Uh, then you must perform a complete physical assessment to evaluate patient's readiness and discuss your uh, results with the multidisciplinary team, which means doctors, respiratory therapists, physiotherapists. And uh, after having the proper personal pro protective equipment, you uh, can then uh, move towards the next step. Next slide, please. Okay. So one of the major important step while we are weaning the patient is doing the suctioning of the patient. Once you auscultate the chest, you see if there are any sort of wheezes, you go for the medical management like Ventolin, NABs, uh, or, or um, any other uh, steroid uh, NABs. But uh, uh, other than that, if there are other sounds, for example, if there are crackles or you see that there are a lot of secretions that patient is having, so you must suction the patient uh, before the weaning process. 
Um, you can also send uh, any sort of sputum specimen for cytology to rule out any pneumonia or pulmonary infection, but you need to discuss it with your doctor first. If you're weaning, you uh, should set the ventilator parameters according to the uh, practitioner's order or your facility weaning protocol. Um, for example, uh, usually the best method that is uh, used for weaning is the spontaneous breathing trial with an pressure support augmentation between five to eight. So that is considered to be the best, uh, you know, a strategy or the best method for weaning. Other than that, you know, TP trials are also used. For example, a 30 minute TP trial may be, a, may be equivalent to a two hour uh, trial in determining the readiness to wean. So TPs and SBTs both can be used. Instruct the patient to breathe normally because once you are uh, shifting the patient from um, assist control or maybe SIMV to spontaneous, the patient's independent breathing should be very uh, much ensured. So patient should be calmed, relaxed, and should be breathing normally. Uh, while uh, all of these things are happening, you have to monitor the patient's vital signs along with the um, chest and abdominal movement for any sort of uh, accessory muscle use. Um, and you have to do the ABGs for ABG analysis. Next slide. Okay. So, um, uh, if the patient does not tolerate the spontaneous breathing trial and get arrhythmias or chest pain, immediately you need to return back to the previous ventilator setting. Uh, but if the patient tolerates the spontaneous breathing trial, you have to um, take that trial up to two hours. One, one, is, one hour is sufficient, but you can take it up to two hours. And then if the patient is able to tolerate uh, the weaning trial, then you go for the... Um, um, extubation process. So uh, again, a team collaboration of respiratory therapists, physiotherapists, doctors, and nurses has to be there for weaning. Once the weaning is completed, uh, you go for the extubation. And now I'm going to discuss the step for steps for extubation. Um, uh, previous slide, please. Yes. Okay. So again, before an extubation, uh, you need to do a proper chest physiotherapy of the patient or, and give nebulize uh, the patient uh, uh, and do the suctioning. Um, before the suctioning, you must hyperoxygenate the patient for 30 to 60 seconds and then do the endotracheal tube suctioning and oropharynx suctioning. And then again, after the suctioning, you hyperoxygenate the patient. Um, after that, you can uh, untape the OETT holder but you must ensure that there has to be somebody else with you. Uh, I mean, uh, you can uh, take assistance from doctor or you can take assistance from um, other nurse. You don't have to you know, extubate the patient all by yourself. You must have somebody with, with you for, for, the, for the backup uh, plan. Then you have to take a 10 ml of syringe that you have to insert it uh, at the balloon um, port of the OETT tube and you have to deflate the um, OETT cuff. Simultane simultaneously, you can check the cuff leak test as well, which I've already explained in the earlier slides. Next step. So then you ask the patient to take deep breaths. And while the patient is having peak inspiration, you have to remove the OETT. Once the OETT is removed, immediately you have to do the suctioning, oral suctioning, um, and ask the patient to cuff and um, you know, um, apply a nebulizer or maybe um, supplemental humidified oxygen, five liter face mask or venturi mask. Sometimes, you know, if there are if, if if there's high risk for intubation, we usually extubate the patient on um, non-invasive ventilator uh, ventilation as well, which is BiPAP. So your BiPAP material should also be ready at your bedside. And then you ask the patient to, uh, you know, encourage the patient for the cuffing exercise and spirometry exercise because it uh, increases the lung capacity and clear all the secretion. And you have to closely monitor the patient at each step. Next slide. Again, after ex extubation, uh, within uh, 30 to 45 minutes of extubation, you have to do the ABG analysis. Make sure you don't do the ABGs um, take out the ABGs while the patient is on uh, NABs because you know you purposefully increase the oxygen level while you're giving the NABs. So that would give the false result in uh, PO2 level. 
so you must keep the patient in a normal state when there is like five liter face mask or venturi mask approach and then you have to do the apgs uh, um, then you can also do the uh, swallowing assessment to identify any sort of aspiration issue because if the swallowing fails the patient might have any aspiration uh, issues so swallowing assessment is important and in the end you discard all the equipment appropriately discard your personal protective equipment because in times of covid-19 again it is very important that the disposal is done appropriately and in the end you do the documentation next slide okay these are certain uh, special considerations we need to take care while we are you know weaning and extubating the patient for example first is that alarm limits should be set appropriately that should be functioning that should be turned on and audible to everyone Uh, allow uninterrupted sleep before weaning to promote the successful weaning because if the patient is having sleep disturbance agitation or delirium that would really hamper the process of uh, weaning and extubation patient's nutritional status should be optimum um because poor nutrition leads to muscle weakness one thing that i would like to mention is that before an extubation it is very important that you keep the patient npo otherwise you keep the patient on feeding but before an extubation it is very important to keep it uh, keep the patient npo just to prevent from any sort of aspiration monitor patient closely for any signs of deterioration within the initial 2 hours to the next 24 to 72 hours what practice we do here at aku is that after an extubation we keep the patient in icu for the next 24 hours just in case uh, if if any sort of deterioration occur and if the patient is safe enough to shift we shift the patient to step down all the ventilator tubing should be intact and should be connected um uh, if if there is any sort of disconnection that could really affect the peak pressures um of of the tube uh, of the ventilator so you know uh, all all the ventilator tubing should be intact a uh, waveform capnography is sometimes used uh, while you know you are weaning the patient just to check the co2 levels uh, on each r um it is very important that you schedule the weaning trial of the patient in very comfortable zone which means that if any sort of activity you have to perform with the patient for example any procedure diagnostic or therapeutic procedure um you have to perform make sure that you perform the procedure first and then you do the weaning and extubation process otherwise the patient would have a lot of fatigue and that would really hamper his um, uh, process of liberation um uh, mind diversion activity again very important because patients are usually very anxious so they need your constant um counseling your support reassurance and mind diversion and the most important thing is that while you are doing the extubation somebody skilled for example um the respiratory therapist or the doctor must be there to to you know assess the process of extubation in case if there is any reintubation required that skilled person could you know come for the reintubation so you don't nurses don't have to do it all by them themselves they they there should be somebody with you who is skilled enough for the reintubation process next slide so what happens that um uh, some patients who fail the weaning fail the extubation trials um undergo the prolonged mechanical ventilation which means uh, that the need for uh, 21 consecutive days of mechanical ventilation and this prolonged uh, weaning failure is usually seen in 10 percentage of the mechanically ventilated patient who consume about 40 uh, 50 percentage of uh, financial cost so you see that if if you are not able to assess the patient uh, timely you are actually increasing the financial cost as well and those patients who are on a uh, prolonged mechanical ventilation one of the options is to go for tracheostomy although there's no specific time period that you know after certain weeks you have to go for a tracheostomy that could vary but one of the safe options to maintain the airway intact is to go for a tracheostomy next slide uh this is the weaning chart that we use here at um, aku we usually fill it after an extubation and we do the uh, vital monitoring in such a way that in the initial first hour of extubation we do the vital monitoring for 15 15 minutes then in the second hour we do it for 30 30 minutes and then consecutively for the third hour and fourth hour we do it hourly basis and th this uh, could lead up to 4 uh, to 5 hours of monitoring next slide 
this is again a patient education form uh, you know as i've already discussed that you need to inform the family and patient about the whole process this needs to be documented as well to whom you are informing and who is informing so that later on um, you know they don't say anything that things are being done and without information also this decreases the anxiety level of the patient and the family so constant interaction counseling of the patient before um, weaning before extubation after weaning after extubation is important next slide so there's an extubation video which dr mohsen would be playing can you see the video yes yes Dr. Mohsen, the audio is not audible. So it looks like you're it's not audible. Mom, you're at seventy percent. You got you on one hundred percent oxygen just for a minute there or two. Can I have a quick listen to breathing if I can? Sounds like you get some stuff done in your lungs, eh? I'm gonna go ahead and just clear some of that out. It's gonna make you cough a little bit. And then pick up back your throat and you might cough a little bit, okay? That's a big cough. Good. Perfect. Just give you a sec, just get your breath back there. I'm just going to have another quick list to make sure we got all of it. I'm going to ask you to open your mouth up there. Let's see if there's anything in your screen. Not there yet. Perfect. Good. Awesome. We just want to make sure there's nothing in the back of your mouth there. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that tube out now. What we're going to do is I'm going to take a couple of nice deep breaths in. And you're taking that deep breath in. There's a little bit of a, there's a little balloon around that tube in your mouth. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull that tube down, pull that balloon down, put all the air inside of it, so we can then pull that tube out. And once that tube's out, I want to take some nice deep breaths in and cough anything in. Your lungs and we can cough that out and clear that up, okay? Perfect, good. So we're gonna get all this stuff ready. Got some tapes on your face there. Just, gonna, just cut those a little bit, okay? Just stay nice and still there for me. Perfect, good. Just turn your head this way a little bit. Breathing machine. I want you to just take a nice deep breath in for me. And one more. One more nice big breath in. Good. Pop that stuff all. Good. <coughs> Anything in your mouth there? Pop that up. I'm going to put you on some oxygen here. Does that feel better? Water. Water. We'll get you some water in a sec there, okay? Just want you to get a nice, breathe it nice and well for me. Some nice breaths in. My oxygen level still look good. Have another listen, okay? Good. 
And you still have some tape on your napkin, so if I can just take that off. Just clean up all this stuff here. Don't want to make any mess at all. Isn't that feeling a lot better? Yeah, that's better. Nice to be able to talk, eh? Oh, yeah. But I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk to the team, tell them to protect you too, that everything went well. Okay. What we'll I do is pour your blood gas in maybe an hour or two just to make sure your breathing is still doing well, okay? What's a blood gas? Blood gas, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna just you got that line in your arm, you're just going to check it and make sure that all your values are still good and your brain is good. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. I'm just going to go document. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just to identify something, whenever somebody is extubated, keep in mind that their FiO2 might go up by 10 to 15%. So that, that is just part of the normal process that they de-recruit some of their lung bases and FiO2 goes up. Do not go into panic if the oxygen needs are going up by 10 or 15%, okay? At least not in the first 15, 20 minutes. And back to you, Zahira. Yeah. Next slide, please. So this is the end slide, a, a summarization slide that you know, ICU is a very comprehensive place where there is a multidisciplinary collaborative approach. And we use uh, usually ICU bundle of care, which is A, B, C, D, E, F bundle of care. Um, the A, B, C, D, E, F uh, usually stands for A is for the assessment of pain. Um, CPOT and BPS is internationally uh, used tools, but here we don't really use it. The B stands for the spontaneous breathing and spontaneous awakening trials that actually fastens the liberation from ventilator. C is for the choice of sedation, what sort of sedation you're giving to the patient, how much dose you're giving, and when you have to hold the sedation for the weaning trial. Uh, D is for the delirium analysis. CAM, ICU, and ICDSC assessment tools are usually used internationally. However, we don't use it here uh, in our hospital. E is for early mobilization. Early mobilization is again very important while you are weaning and extubating the patient um, because you know the early mobilization increases the lung efficiency. It decreases the uh, neuromuscular weakness, ICU acquired weakness, ICU acquired delirium. So early mobilization is again a very therapeutic procedure. And the last is family engagement and family empowerment. At each step of ICU care, you must do it. Uh, here I end my uh, presentation. I hope that uh, you're able to understand the basics of liberation from ventilator. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zahira. That was wonderful. Uh, the next thing to know is that we realize that Mrs. N gets a, has got quite a bit of secretions coming out. Every time we try to reduce her sedation, she gets a bit agitated. Her respiratory rate goes up. So we are thinking that she might not uh, have a successful extubation. So we are going to now talk, consider tracheostomy and the next talk is going to focus on that. Uh, we still have some time. So if anybody has any questions, raise your hand and we will allow you to speak and hopefully uh, we can answer those now. If nobody raises their hand, then, then we are kind of done. And uh, okay, there is one hand raised by Ayaz. So Ayaz, go ahead. Unmute yourself, you're still muted and you can ask your question. Ayaz, you're still mute. You need to unmute yourself to be able for us to hear you. Okay, in the meanwhile, I've had a question from Q&A, who Hello. I asked said, can you again explain ABCDF approach, please? So I'll go back to that slide. Zaira, do you want to take this over again? Yeah. 
so uh, basically the a b c d e f is a bundle which is used for icu care and icu management for patients it is a very comprehensive bundle um um you know we don't only use it for the liberation of ventilator but we generally use it for icu patients for their overall management so a stands for assessing the uh, assessing and preventing and managing the pain uh, for example if if the patients who are um coming post operatively to icu usually they they uh, they come to surgical icu they have a lot of pain so how do you assess their pain how do you assess the pain of a mechanically ventilated patient there are certain tools that are internationally used uh, those tools are very you know detailed i won't be discussing those tools but based on those tools you identify what is the level of your uh, patient's pain and based on that you provide the analgesia care uh, second is b which is spontaneous awakening trials and spontaneous breathing trials so spontaneous awakening trials is more associated with holding the sedation so that the patient could be awakened and that could be followed by spontaneous breathing trials for again uh, weaning and extubation uh, we have uh, very um, comprehensively and in detail um, discussed the the process of liberation from ventilator so that is basically uh, associated with the b portion which is sat and sbt c is the choice of sedation usually propofol or midazolam or dexmedetomidine are some of the sedations that are commonly used in icus so doctors usually um, inform nurses that what sort of sedation they have to administer at what rate they have to administer how for how long they have to administer whether it should be given in a bolus form whether it should be given in an infusion form so this is the choice of sedation which sedation is appropriate for which patient uh and for what purpose uh d is delirium monitoring and delirium assessment again there is a tool that is internationally used which is cam icu and icdsc tool uh we don't use it here in um in um, our setting but it is an evidence based practice that once you identify the delirium status of the patient who is on mechanical ventilation you provide the appropriate antipsychotics or hyperactive um, um, or, or an, um, anti sedative drugs um to manage the delirium because delirium uh, can you know really uh, affect the quality of life of patient once they are discharged from the hospital or icu the uh, 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 second last is the early mobilization and uh, exercise just to share um Uh, with you all that currently uh, in my master's program i am doing my research on early mobilization of mechanically ventilated patients since this concept is very new in pakistan although it is an evidence based practice being done internationally in in va various hospitals of um, america and canada brazil australia but here in pakistan this concept of early mobilization of mechanically ventilated patient is not yet explored so uh, usually there's a protocol for early mobilization how do you assess the patient for early mobilization what are what are the uh, eligibility criteria uh, then based on that assessment there are certain steps moving from the in bed exercises to out of bed exercises like uh, in bed exercises are usually the passive and active range of motion and then out of bed exercises are from bed to chair to ambulation so there's a whole protocol that is followed and last is the family engagement and empowerment uh, whenever you are dealing with icu patients you must ensure that the family is aware about each and every step because family is not with the patient all the time you are the ones who are with the patient you are the ones who know about the patient in detail so you must counsel the family about what is going on with the patient and what is the plan of care and all of these things are usually discussed in the multidisciplinary rounds that are usually done um, daily um, uh, you know by physicians and those rounds does not include the physicians only but nurses have to participate as well um, physiotherapists have to participate as well respiratory therapists have to participate as well and combine you know devise a plan of care for the patient based on these a b c d e f bundle i hope it is clear now Thank you, Zahira. Uh, there was one other question about the MCQs, but uh, Abhijan Hani has raised their hand. Would you mind asking your question? Okay. While they we wait, just to answer the MCQs on this session were a bit uh, 
complex in terms that we did not ask you for positive answers, but negative ones. So we didn't say what are the indications of something, but we asked you what are not the indications, which makes it a bit more complex to answer them. But the hope was that it will make you really think things through. So the idea of the question is not to just figure out what your understanding is, but actually to instigate a thinking process. Uh, and then Muhammad Saeed has raised hand. So Muhammad Saeed, you're the last question to be answered today. I'll allow you to talk. So if you can ask your question, please. Yeah. Good evening and good morning. Yeah, just my uh, question is after extubation that we can repeat uh, ABG uh, if uh, there is a criteria to repeat ABG and how much frequency we are going to repeat it. Okay. Thank you. Zaira, do you want to yeah. answer or do you want me to take this? Yeah, you can take it. Okay. So usually what I will tell you, whatever practice is that 15 minutes post extubation, we will do the first gas. And after that, it will be done at an hour unless there's any concern in terms of hemodynamics. And then we, we continue to do it hourly for the first four hours. And then uh, once we feel that the ABG arterial light is no long, arterial line is no longer needed, we will stop doing gases. Thank you. Thank Can you. I add something, uh, Dr. Mohsen, do. if you allow me? Yes, please, please. Just to continue your point, since ABGs are quite expensive here, so in our practice, we usually prefer to do it once, you know, after an extubation, which means within like uh, 30 to 45 minutes, you have to do the ABGs. If the ABGs are deteriorating, of course, you have to repeat it based on the physician's order. Uh, but if the ABGs are fine, you don't really have to repeat it. And then the ABGs are done, you know, 20, um, once in 24 hours. And well, as you said that uh, if the arterial line is then uh, not required, then we, you know, discontinue the arterial line as well. Wonderful. Thank you, presenters. Thank you for those who attended. And uh, it has been a wonderful session. And goodbye to all. Thank you so much. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz.